Hello and welcome to another episode of What's Good Mzanzi with me, your host, Jared Petzer. Today we are going to be speaking to none other than Kusta Jack. He's a former political activist um, and he's now a prominent businessman in Port Elizabeth. Uh, Kusta, was born on, um, Kusta was born in Hammensdorp in 1958. He fought for the right to, edu uh, to education between 1975 and 1986. Uh, Jack was detained numerous times due to his participation in the protests and instigation of consumer boycott, um, all in a bid to make education available to children of color. During the 90s, the late 90s, uh, Kusta earned his honors degree in economics and social studies, uh, sorry, in development studies from Sussex University in England. And today he is a successful businessman, celebrated author, and a wonderful example of someone who beat all the odds. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Kusta has also been a, a very important part of the development of I'm Staying MPC. He's, uh, he's helped to advise us and to guide us along this process um, in all of our workshops to help structure the, the, uh, the core fundamentals of, of what we represent. Kusta, how are you doing, my friend? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm fine. And you, how are you doing, Janice? I'm good. I'm good, Kusta. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm keeping myself really busy with these interviews and, uh, and obviously keeping myself occupied during the, during the lockdown period. How, how are you coping on that side? Well, I am. I am. It is uh, tough, but necessary. And I think it's, uh, we are well guided in the country. And if we were to really concentrate and focus on what we are being told and, uh, uh, a lot of good will come out of it, meaning that a lot of uh, people will be saved and uh, we may not even test our non-existent uh, uh, resources. Uh, that's right. You know, I have to agree with you. I think there's been a wonderful effort made by, by our leaders in South Africa to, to sort of help and uh, keep this thing contained and under control. And we all just need to do our little bit in order to make sure that this is a successful lockdown and that we can reduce the, the, the damage caused by corona. Exactly. That's so true. Yeah. Kusta, um, just, just for our viewers that aren't familiar with you, can you just t tell us a little bit about your, your upbringing? I mean, I, I know you were brought up on the, on the farms. Um, just tell us a little bit about how, how, how your life was as, as a youngster growing up. Oh, well, I mean, my life uh, is the same as any other uh, young black South African born around that time. Uh, what is uh, a little bit unique in my case is that uh, um, a lot of the lives of the kids who grew up on the farms is not properly documented and by even by leaders who grew up on the farm is few written about it and so I am in a, a very fortunate position that uh, I grew up on the farms and on the farms as you know it was really at the cold face of apartheid directly on a daily basis, person to person, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and then I, I became fortunate also to be, uh, uh, to manage to get myself in the city illegally in those days, totally illegally. And then of course I experienced a life of people in uh, congested and densely populated areas, which I found was more protective than the life of growing up on the farms where uh, actually your family you were all by your own there were no uh, kind of uh, 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 backup or support in terms of even the various available uh, legal uh, resources that were there in the cities uh, on the farms there were none of that and that was actually the kind of uh, opportunities that uh, I exploited to the full when I came to the city to be a voice and to speak to people and uh, that helped me and uh, a lot of people I was lucky. They afforded me a platform to raise my frustrations, if you like, and uh, it, was, it was good, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, interestingly enough, we, we had uh, Musimi Amani on the show a little while ago, and it was uh, just interesting to listen to his account of growing up in Dobsonville and, and the experiences that he had. And he spoke a lot about, about close communities and how um, the neighbors had the authority, you know, given to you by your parents in his instance, where, the, where you know, everybody was, enabled, was allowed to discipline the children and make sure that the, make sure that the community was, was well taken care of. There was, a lot, there was a strong sense of community. I mean, you must have experienced that as well. Oh, yes. Look, I mean, the uh, life is life. In life, you've got good people, you've got bad people. And uh, I write about this in my book, and uh, I shocked people at Oxford University uh, once when I was in a, a debate there. Before I even went overseas, I was there on an illegal trip, and then I happened to address uh, these uh, hundreds of students. And that because I told people that, well, on the farms, there were bad farmers, and there were many good farmers that I know. Some of them were my friends, some of them were my, actually are my, sort of like my family, even today. I mean, if I got any functions, they are there, they participate and so on. And those were Afrikaner people and so on. And there are, on the same farms, there are people, <laughs> black people, uh, who didn't agree with me, who didn't like my conduct or behavior, as they call it. And uh, up to this day, I mean, they are not uh, uh, chuffed about uh, uh, me anyway, but they won't uh, unnecessarily come to <laughs> attend my things. Uh, so I was uh, narrating this and telling uh, stories of uh, good uh, experiences or of of farmers, for example, like ourselves. We were saved by a farm, an African farmer in Mastin North here, who, after being homeless and so on and so on, and he threw us in, he gave us a place to stay without working for him, without accounting to him. And I can tell you maybe the, my ability to be a voice and speak came from that because I was not chained to anybody. As you know, on the farms, you must go and milk for the farmer, you must go and do this, you must do this if you stay on their farm. If you don't do that, they kick you out. So that gave me latitude to have the kind of uh, freedom that I use a lot myself to, to develop my character of resistance, all right? And uh, what Musi is talking about is true that uh, uh, society in those days was very good and actually up till recently where everybody listened to what is right all right what is right is always right it doesn't matter who says it okay the person if he tells you that okay look you can't go there if you get in there this is what is going to happen and if it's just true it's true it doesn't change because who says it to you. So that uh, attitude and values that were there were the kind of things that molded people to be uh, more responsible and accountable in their actions everywhere where you walk, young, old, and everybody. And that is why we managed to survive, especially throughout those difficult times of uh, uh, racial polarization in this country. So. Uh, uh, it's very important that uh, the, that matter, Musi, or anyone raises because a lot of young people today seem to believe that abnormality is normal, and I think it's not. And those of us who've got a memory of some kind, they need to hammer this point at every available opportunity. Yeah, I love what you said there, um, Kusta. And I think one of the problems that we have as South Africans, and this is right across the board, is that we look at things um, in polarization. We look at a white community as being a problem. We look at a black community as being a problem. We look at the colored community or Indian community as being a problem. We forget that people are individuals. Some people have got specific values and some people have got specific beliefs and other people have got their own sets of values and their own sets of beliefs. And uh, it's very important for us, and I think that's why we want to use this opportunity to, uh, in this discussion for us to really help understand that, you know, you either have certain values in your life that are going to enable you to help people and to protect people and to, and to make our nation go forward, or you're going to have a different set of values that are, going to, that are going to do exactly the opposite. And those values are going to try and break apart. They're going to try and create the division wherever they can because it suits their needs. 
Um, yeah. So I think that's very important. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is that is that human nature um, is is a lot of it specific to your upbringing and your life experiences. Look, in society, that you always have people who thrive on disorder. Okay. <laughs> There are few, and there are few of these kinds of people. I don't know, in their minds, they believe or that they can profit or benefit from a chaotic society. But that's short-sighted because it's not sustainable. If you are chaotic, there's always somebody more chaotic than yourself. Until the society remembers that, we're gonna be in trouble. Because for if these, the anarchist, those who believe disorder can, can lead us to prosperity. They are wrong. Disorder will be disorder. It will be replaced by disorder. Ours is to strive towards bringing order. Now that we are a free South Africa, what we need to do, we know that uh, uh, discrimination of any kind is bad. We know that uh, undermining people is bad and bullying people is bad. So what do we do? We know also what is right. So ours as a nation is to strive to do the right thing. And if we do that, I can tell you we are going to be rewarded. But if we, we, we take a shortcut, as you know, any uh, uh, shortcut is attractive, but it has terrible consequences. So the long route that we take is more painful, is more hard as I show in my book to survive and succeed. You know, the more you take the long, difficult route, the better the outcome. So we need just to be patient with our people and try to get ourselves back and make people understand that we'll be great if we are a united nation. Look, I mean, whether you like it or not, look at the United States of America. You know what is good about America is that the United States of America is built with people coming from all corners of the world. But once they land into that soil, everyone becomes an American and work towards the same common good. I know they had their own problems as they go through that, but even in the darkest times, they understood one thing that the loyalty and obedience to the nation and the country was paramount. And that is what we need to strive for in this country, in all the facets of life, not just on one thing, but in everything, economy, education, everything we must work towards building that common ground so that we become the nation that we ought to be and that actually we strive to be. Yeah, that's listen. That's a that's a powerful sentiment, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Now, Kusta, having having you know, being part of of this this uprising in in the the, the mid seventies, mid to late seventies, tell me. I mean, there was there was so much there was so much desire for the youth to have a, a, an education, to, to be a part of to be a part of a um, a society where they had the same equal and fair opportunities as everybody else. And when we're looking at the, the country today, it's, it, there seems to be a, a big shift um, or, a, or a big disconnect between the values of what the children fought for and the youth fought for back in, uh, back in the early days of South Africa in, compar in comparison to how they, how they are conducting themselves today. Now, we can't, again, polarize and, and generalize um, all youth because we can't do that. But there's, there's definitely this level of, of disruption that's happening. And is, is there some level of concern there for you? I mean, I mean, what are your views on where we are right now from that regard? Well, look, I mean, the, 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 the problems have not disappeared. The problems have that shifted, you know, uh, uh, if you like, they shifted the color or the character or whatever, but the problems are still there. And of course, I'm not going to unnecessarily condemn the reaction of today's young people, because remember, they deal with the conditions they face. So they, in their wisdom, they apply sometimes what they believe is working for them. So which is different really from us. We had one common enemy that was straightforward and we were easily united around it. 
and we needed just to be brave and to be knowledgeable. It was critical if you were going to lead that you make yourself available to know each and everything that needs to be known about what we are dealing with, okay? That was one thing. And uh, because of that, then we were united in terms of uh, uh, knowing what we are fighting for because all black people, as you know, at the time were uh, uh, the same, treated the same. <laughs> there was no such thing as a, a black middle class or anything like that. Uh, the government didn't care whether you are a lawyer or whatever. You are treated the same way as a sweeper. Mm. So you unite the people like that. But in the new order, what is happening is that uh, there is a, a numerous problems. One of them, of course, is a class distinction or the class uh, uh, that has developed uh, 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 differences within the black people themselves and between the blacks and the whites. Those divisions are, are sort of like, uh, 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 if you like, divisions that are found in any society, anywhere in the world, because basically the class distinction is something that will be there. But the, 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 the distinctions that we have to deal with are those that relates to such things as if you, what language do you speak, what race are you, and so on and so on. Those are really not acceptable. Uh, in terms of all United Nations, uh, 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 what you call protocols or decisions and so on. And of course, in terms of humanity, because uh, 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 you can't discriminate a person on the basis of uh, uh, race, on the basis of color, on the basis that is uh, tall or short or things like that. No. It's, uh, hence, uh, uh, in South Africa, uh, the issue of uh, South Africa being a racist country, it was because why, why it was declared South Africa as a, a crime against humanity, it was because they legislated racism, okay? It's not like when you, the two of us go and look for a job, they employ the best or they discriminate me because I come from uneducated family and so on. That's a different story. That happens all over the world. Nobody will declare that as a crime against humanity, as bad as it is. But now, the young people now are confronted with those kinds of things. They, got, they, are, they are poor. They come, some of them come from very poor families. Some come from families that have uh, done well in the new order. And uh, uh, they see the talk of freedom and so on. And, uh, and there's a lack of readiness on the state to to prepare for these people to really graduate into this class they aspire to go to and they find the door locked up and it creates polarization. And on top of it all, there are also some of the defici deficiencies in the things that we thought about in the past, like availability of quality equipment at the schools, such as libraries, playing fields, uh, what is a like, uh, what is a laboratories, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We should not find in our schools, but you find them in the other schools. Those kinds of things they create now this resentment. Of course, in my opinion, then I think even so, those kids need to be told that to burn the library in the midst of that is not wise. Strategically, it's not a, a good thing. It's not uh, helpful because when we burn things now, it's not going to be easy to replace them because uh, we've got so many uh, needs and so on and so on. So yeah, uh, what I'm trying to say, you cannot make a direct, uh, a direct uh, uh, comparison between uh, the struggles of today and yesterday's struggles. Yeah, I have to agree with you 100% on that. I think, you know, we, we've spoken to this a lot. The fact that even though there was, there was, a, there was a, a freedom in the sense of a, a, new, a new changeover and, and liberation, there's still um, so many people in South Africa today that, have, that are wearing shackles. They're wearing shackles in terms of not being able to get education. They're wearing shackles in terms of not being able to use their education properly. Um, there are people that have been educated that, that have got no uh, opportunities to work. And I think these things 
are constantly going to going to bind us. They're going to hold South Africa's hands behind uh, behind its back because um, without those things, we cannot have a prosperous economy, and we cannot start to subside those those resentments. The, the one thing that I'm really in, enjoying about where we are as a, as a nation right now is that we've got we've got all of these little split offs. You know, uh, we've got uh, one South Africa, we've got uh, the People's Dialogue, we've got even hashtag I'm staying. We've got all of these little split offs that are starting to happen now. And really what it's doing is it's creating this wonderful opportunity for people to be able to speak, to communicate, instead of just you know, being stuck in your frustrations and only seeing a person once every couple of months or once every few years, or whatever the case may be, when they need something. Now it's about saying, cool, how do, we, how do we listen to your frustrations and how do we work towards those things? I mean, in your view, do you think that these, these, these little split offs and, these, and the coming together of these things is, is uh, important to South Africa? Oh, yes. Listen, every effort, every effort towards constructing the society of our dreams is something to be welcomed. No amount of failure should deter people from trying to work towards what they believe is what they deserve. Even if you are a lonely voice in the wilderness, continue to shout your say because if you don't do that then the abnormal becomes normal and uh, my experience of uh, having been in the struggle from 1976 i don't know you know how many organizations were formed to try and get people to rise I'm sure you guys today, you only concentrated watching the pictures that you saw after 1990. After 1976, or rather, let me go just step back, in 1960, in the 60s, after the leaders of the uh, liberation movement were thrown into jail, others uh, left the country, others were forced to flee, others thrown to Robben Island. There was a, a general lull because the people were shell-shocked by the brutal reaction of the state. And uh, a lot of black people, many of them, some of them were deeply involved in those activities. They just disappeared. And uh, they went to churches and they hid there, never to be known, never to mention any name of PAC or ANC, never. They were scared, some. But others, those who were still bold, they were hunted down until apartheid nearly smashed the resistance. But slowly it built up with people on and around the 19, late 1960s, around about 1968 or so. There were these guys uh, led by the people like uh, uh, the Steve Biggers and others before them. Uh, raising through the black consciousness. The aim was to try to take away that shell shock and that fear that was uh, administered by the system to them, to the nation. But a lot of people thought this was a joke. Ah, these uh, intellectuals sitting and drinking. These were few guys, okay? You can count them. Now, I'm telling you because a lot of people think that from the 1960s, from 1912, every black South African has been involved in the struggle. There's no such thing. People were, have given up on the struggle. They believed there was no point. The apartheid government was too powerful. They took the best brain that the country ever had of our people. So who are we? And then, but slowly these uh, young people started to rise and they rise. And actually, I have never met Steve Biko. I've never seen him. And a lot of people have never seen him, by the way. He was only known in the universities where he was and in some small meetings they would have, and so on and so on. Uh, the other friends of they, his, I happen to know them because they were in Port Elizabeth and, and Utnick and, and King Williamstown. And others, of course, they they their friends were sort of like uh, people that i learned about them later on. so the the participation was not wide 
I'm trying to say, as people say now, okay, no, this is a small thing, this is a small party there, so don't listen to them. There's no such thing. If you are consistent with what you talk about, and you never lie, and you never distort facts, and you are straight with the people, you are honest, the people are taking note. And one day, these people are going to be behind you in what you are doing and say to you, yes, we hear you. Uh, I remember when we started our own uh, meetings later on, we used to be about 10 people first. And then when we go call people to a big rally, at a, a big hall, and then it's only us, the organizers, for that matter, let's say the executive of about 10 people, and the police are, they came with their trucks and so on outside. They are roaming the building. And then let's say on a Saturday, around about three or three o'clock or two, two o'clock, they come to us and say, hey, Costa, I say, no, the people are coming. Nobody, it's empty. There are more security police inside this place than we think. And then they say, okay, eh, where is it? Nas Buota can no spear you. Those days, Nas Buota was playing for the Northern Transvaal. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a, a, a carry cup game, okay? This guy, Kari Bieter, Vestry, North Transvaal, spear <laughs> with the uh, uh, Transvaal, okay? So this they tell us that we must get on with the business, but we know deep down, gosh, we are not going, people are not coming, and the meeting will call you, and they will laugh at us, and they will turn down with their cars, <laughs> back to watch their rugby games, you know, because people think that, and that went on for a long time. Let me tell you, uh, actually, things started to change in South Africa dramatically after the killing of the credo four. Yeah, even in my own family, that was the only time that I was confident that everybody in my family supported me in the struggle. Before that, not, they, did, they said, oh, Kusta, you just, because you have nothing to do, you just like uh, attention, you just like this, and there was no attention, by the way, but anyway, they say you just do this. But after uh, the, the state of emergency that was declared by PW Border, I think the numbers of people to the struggle, and I, I can say that I think that it was a turning point for everyone. And the big numbers in South Africa started to follow the struggle. But before that, people thought we were just a joke. <laughs> Cheapest. That's. I mean, that's. It's, it's so amazing listening to you. To you tell the story like that because you do in your mind. You've got this idea that everybody was in. Everybody was in. Everybody was in full support. No, no, no. There was no such thing. No ways. No ways. I mean, look, the trade union movement. Just think of it. Uh, they started, let's say, in the seventies, early seventies, in Durban area, and that was quickly smashed and, uh, uh, and it disappeared in its effectiveness. Okay. And then it, it came back again on and around 1979, okay, when uh, the new uh, radical trade unions were formed. And that is how uh, really the, the stages and the kicks of the struggle took place. It wasn't a hooray. The rest of our people at the time, most of them, the majority were going to follow what we call, they were following what we call the puppet leaders. That is the homeland leaders, okay? We call them puppet leaders. Let's say the leader of the Transkai, Siskai, Ukutatswana, Guazulu, uh, 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 and uh, so on and so on. We call them uh, because they were working with the government, working with the system. So we're not agreeing with them and we call them puppet. So most of our parents were supporting these people because some of them were decent people, but unfortunately they followed a treacherous path in our opinion. There were sellouts and then we had that job to undo first to get our people to understand that 
we were talking that I struggled. <laughs> but with us now, hence I'm saying to you, any effort towards uh, normalizing South African society and making it right and standing up for what is correct in whatever corner you are, no matter how small and how powerful you are, it counts. All right? There is no such thing that it doesn't count. The day you have that in your mind, that is the day you will allow anarchy to prevail upon us forever. If you've just joined us now, we're talking to none other than Kusta Jack, just taking a, a walk down memory lane and uh, just discussing the, the, the way in which things used to work here. And, um, and uh, this is just the most amazing conversation, Kusta. I'm really enjoying what, what, we, what we're discussing here. Tell, me, uh, tell us a little bit about um, the, how, you got into, how you got into business. I mean, how you actually started getting yourself going because I'd imagine you wouldn't have had support and huge financial uh, backing behind you. I mean, how did you actually get yourself going in, in, during that time? No, I remember after uh, uh, Nelson Mandela was released in 1990, I decided that uh, I wasn't going to be involved in politics again, ever. And uh, the reason for that, it was because I was exhausted. I was tired. I mean, all my life, since I moved from the farms, from my days on the farms, I used to fight to be the one that goes into the door that says whites only, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and be kicked and all that kind. And I was the weakest amongst the people I'm with, but I was the one who has to go and face up the bullies, you know. And uh, when we met Nelson Mandela in his uh, prison, I raised the point to him, I said, you know what? If you were to leave this prison, walk outside free, that day, I don't want to talk politics. I want to live a normal life. And of course, Mandela said, ha, ha, ha. Ha, ah, it's so dark. You are not. You are joking. You know, something like that. But, and of course I did that. When I, uh, when he, he got out, I, 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 I step aside. And I left, and then I wanted to also to go and complete my studies. So remember, Jared, I have started school at the age of 10. Remember, when I was in standard three and four, I was the only child in those classes, okay? There was no other one. I was the only child in the class. So the threat of closing the school was a daily thing. When I see officials, I used to shiver and cry because I thought they are coming to discuss that the school must be closed because it was threatened from day one. And then when I started schooling, I lost four years of schooling, okay? And um, all of that, besides the first starting at the age of 10, okay? You can see I'm old already now. By your standard, my daughter is 21 now. He's already finishing a master's degree. By that time, I haven't finished my matric. Eh? In 90, when I was doing my standard 10, I was taken in a classroom because the night before, I spoke at the memorial service of Dr. Neil Agate in East London. So that was the end of my schooling. So I haven't, I had sort of like 10 years in 1990 that I haven't, I would have been at university use that time earlier on to go to, wish I didn't. So in 89, I'm sitting in jail this time of the year. I'm waiting to face a treason trial whereby the security police have vowed that in my case, there was going to be no uh, mistake. The death penalty was going to be imposed, okay? so. This time in 1989, okay, I'm sitting with my friends, we are about seven. That's what we are contemplating. So I was personally drained and I didn't. And I was so confident that also that our leadership was going to do all what we have suffered for. Ultimately, I was 100%. There was no doubt, there was no if, there was no but. I knew that I'm going to be this person who lived a life. And then, of course, I went to university. I went overseas. 
when I came back, I worked for a, a, the corporate sector for a short time, and thereafter I went to work for a company. Uh, I mean, I, I, I went on my own. And when I started, of course, I failed, as you know, uh, in the first three projects, the disaster, and it was really, uh, entrepreneurship was not what I thought from a distance was. I thought it was just getting in and the money flowing in, <laughs> money flowing in. I was really believing that, oh, I'm going to have a boat, I'm going to have my own private jet and all those things. But uh, all of that did not happen, okay? Uh, of course, I worked, uh, I got, I got uh, money from the from a banker who was just uh, supporting the idea of black empowerment and the entry of black people into uh, into into the mainstream economy, and uh, he never tested me to see whether all the tests that they do in the bank, as you know. And he gave me an overdraft of 200,000 rand. Yo! Little! And then unfortunately got shifted away. And then there I was not delivering. I was living off this uh, overdraft, <laughs> going on with my normal payments and things like that. And then the, the managers who were not convinced about the decision of that manager. They thought they were going to, yeah, to prove that this idea of black empowerment is nonsense and is going nowhere. And it's going to destroy its own natural death. And of course I lost the point. But to cut the long story short, I did pay each and every cent that I was given. Simply because of that person, Mr. Alec Grant from FNB, because that Mr. Alec Grant had faith in BE. So I thought I would do everything in my power, not only to myself, I told those other beggars, I said to them, it's okay, you may mock me, you may laugh at me. Yes, I don't know about anything about, about balance sheet and so on and so on, because it was never discussed with my family. There was no such a conversation with my family. But nonetheless, I will pay you up to the last cent to prove that Mr. Grant was right, that black empowerment is a, is a correct thing and it's a right thing to do, okay? And then, of course, from there onwards, I paid them back and slowly I built myself properly through hard work and and that's why and today I don't complain. I did all right. I, I work hard and uh, I face, I took no shortcuts and I'm still there. But as you know, in business, success is current. You can never talk about your success tomorrow. <laughs> By the end of this conversation, Mr. Jack could be bankrupt. And <laughs> that's how yeah. it works. You know, it's it's fascinating. So in the in the late nineties, um, my my mother and my father had a personnel consultancy, and um, my mom was getting all these applications from these these young black men that had gone overseas. They went into exile. They went and studied in in the UK yeah. and whatnot, and they were incredibly well experienced. They had these fantastic educations, and they couldn't get work here, obviously, because it was still the old the old government. And um, yeah. my mom used to sit and she used to she used to feed feed some of these guys. She used to talk to them, and she yeah. had this, she had a really yeah. big heart for them, you know. And yeah. um, she, she used to take all of these CVs and she stacked them up. She had piles and piles and piles of these CVs, massive piles to the ceiling. And everybody said to her, you're wasting your time. We're never going to get a job for these people. And then as true as nuts, boom, the changeover came. 1994, Nelson Mandela took power, uh, the ANC took power in South Africa. And my mom was the only one sitting on this gold mine. <laughs> she had these, she had these yeah. CVs for days and days and days. And it, I mean, it, 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 it was amazing to see that, you know, she, she just believed in her heart that at some time she was going to be able to help these people. Yeah. And, uh, and eventually the wheel turned and she was able to do that. So it was remarkable. Um, yeah, the point is not to betray, you know, when a person puts such faith in you, Mm. It is really your responsibility. That's what I believe even in us in the struggle. Yeah. It is easy to betray people. Betraying people could be like, I could say, no, no, there's no such thing as state capture. There's nothing about corruption. These people is just all nonsense. But there are people that put faith in me once upon a time. Mm. 
upon the fact that I was going to do the things the right way mm. and I was going to be honest. So I cannot afford to be just dishonest for the sake of it, for cheap, uh, uh, quick gain. I cannot do that. Yeah. That is why I believe that even in the case of Mr. Grant, I apply that principle to him that I was going to do everything in my power, never to allow those to say, we told you so. I said, you have said, there was not going to happen. <laughs> no way, it's not with me. Do you, do you still have a relationship with him? Yes, yeah, I see him, but I haven't seen him in the last, uh, like, what, six months? Uh -huh. Yeah, I, <laughs> I see him all the time. Yeah. Amazing. I, I remind him all the time. Amazing. And even those other ones, I say to him, I paid each and every cent I got from the bank <laughs> because all was what was at stake. It wasn't me, it was Mr. Grant's credibility. Yeah. That's amazing. That's really amazing. Um, it just, I mean, talking around the, the BEE structures and, I, you know, I, I think it was an amazing idea. I really do. Because how else do you sort of bring people across the line faster? But somewhere along the line, obviously, things went a little bit wrong. What, what do you think we can do, Kusta, to, to, to take that model and actually make it an effective model that really serves the, the needs of the people? To actually help people and that we've got legitimate businesses, people that are coming through legitimately through the ranks, to, to sort of start stimulating our economy because our economy is stifled. We, we definitely need to expand on that economy and we need to do it the right way. What, what in your opinion do you think changes we can make in order to get this BEM model to work? Okay, let me, tell, let me tell you something. You see, before uh, 1989, in December 1989, I never thought of ever studying economics <laughs> because I was just fascinated by economics like everybody else. Uh, as uh, comrades at the time, we were more fascinated for polemical issues like uh, whether Marxism or capitalism was right. Mm -hmm. And that is, it ended there. Mm -hmm. Not a single one of us during the liberation struggle discussed the nitty gritties of running a factory. Mm -hmm. Because for us, we were not at that stage, okay? The sudden developments towards the rapid change that happened caught us off guard in terms of discussing the nuts and bolts of the economy all mm -hmm. right so that's one thing because a lot of people do not understand why we we got it so wrong in some of the economic issues it is precisely because of that when you talk of any other discipline you will notice that we we, we thought them very well, human rights and all those things, uh, yeah. So I was in Paris at this conference, which was organized by the then French president and his wife, uh, Francois Mitterrand. And uh, the top business people of South Africa got invited. This was a culmination of uh, the, the celebration of the French Revolution of 17 or 18, 1789 or whatever. So we were, the French government used the opportunity to run a workshop for South Africans. Those in exile, those inside the country, those inside the country who are in business and those who are trade unions. Okay, we are at this place now in the top of the French power out there, okay? And, uh, this is uh, December 1989, as I say. In discussions, I observe that. Hello? Inside the country, outside the country, and everywhere. We were all one and very clear when we talk about the politics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when we were speaking economics, I noted that, gosh, ooh, there's big problems here. <laughs> I didn't notice it before. Then I realized there was a guy called Ronnie Bethlehem. He was an economist of uh, JCI, then known as Johannesburg uh, Consolidated Investments. And this guy was their chief economist. Well, it's the first time uh, we are in a place with these kinds of titles, you know. 
and the, the heads of the uh, land bank, development bank, all of them were the top established Afrikaner guys, you know, who most of them would have come from the faculty of economics at the University of Stellenbosch and so on. And these guys, of course, when the discussion started to move into the economy, gosh, I saw a terrible deficiency on our side. And then as a result of that, that is why after that, when I went to university, I studied economics and development studies because I knew that you, we, got, we are short. Because our guys at that time mostly would be legal people and all the other disciplines. Of course, we do have at the, in the team, Tabo Mbeki, Tito Mboweni, and I can't remember who else, we had about three or so. And of course, with the trade unions like Alec Ewin, who were more also, and, uh, and others who were more uh, left-wing win in their outlook. Uh, they, in my view, their economic uh, philosophies or theories were not uh, the kind of thing I was looking for because it wasn't practical. Yeah. And uh, Jay Naidu and all of them, they were good at that. But <clears throat> Coming to the issue of the BE now. The BE idea, I never, <clears throat> excuse me, we never thought about this previously, but it was worked out during the dispensation between that period, I guess, uh, and right through to the, uh, to the creation of the constitution, which was a good idea. It was based on the idea that how are we going to fast track black people who have been kept outside the economy completely and this, of course, the blueprint was supposed to be, although maybe people will accept it, but it was based on the same methodology used by the Afrikaners after the after they won the, 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 the National Party won in 1948. So before that, as you know, the mainstream economy was dominated by the dominant English people. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea. But in my opinion, the mistake that we made along the way first, besides the corruption and all the others, was this thing of not adhering to what was meant by affirmative action and BE. BE was meant and affirmative action that you will assist the best of the Lord. Let's say if you, you throw something there, you call black people to participate in it. Mm. Or you call people, okay, and then your aim is to support a black person in this. What you do, you make sure that you get black people that can do this thing, first of all. Mm. And then you take the best of the lot. Mm. In so doing, the same in employment, in so doing, then you will continue to, uh, to in an incremental basis, fast track, Mm. The, the, the copy or a lot of people will imitate this successful black person. Because if there is a successful black person who succeeded in a natural way, more black people will succeed. Others will follow, of course. But, yes, but if they succeed through artificial means, then you lost the game. Mm. And that's where most of the things have gone wrong. Yeah. You know, the one thing I can note is that, and, and this comes from many, many years ago, listening to, to small white owned businesses, they also never got the point of it. In their view, it was about being able to continue doing business. And that was the bottom line. There was no, there was no deeper understanding of how important it was to, to, to create an equal society in South Africa. It was all about rands and cents. It was a, 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 a matter of being able to trade in your business. And I think the, part, the point was lost there. And that comes down to... Um, uh, not being vulnerable and not having vulnerable discussions around why it was so important for us to be able to have a shared economy. And I think that's, that's the thing, you know, we, we, we've done a lot in terms of communication, but not enough. And I think this is the time now for us to really be having these important conversations and saying, guys, this is the reason why we have to do things the way we have to do them. We have to have your, your whole heart participating. You know, this is not a, a matter of only the mind. It's also a matter of the heart. How do we, how do we turn the economy? You know, listen, what happened there. My experience, I have done a lot of uh, observation and research and reading and study the phenomenon of BE and affirmative action in its early stages and how it got stuck, okay? 
First of all, everybody was geared to do the right thing. And for a, a period of time during Mandela's rule, um, BE was moving in the right direction. And uh, to a certain extent, and Ambeki also, it was uh, still, but uh, problems of artificial uh, empowerment and these uh, bogus empowerment uh, things started to creep in. And then when that happened, then of course everybody moved into a cocoon and start to devise his own methods of survival. And in that, that is why today you will find that for the last 10 years of radical economization, actually, uh, black people have suffered more or moved backward in terms of those joint ventures, those partnerships, those whatever, because what happened? Instead of the ordinary white guy, entrepreneur, going out there and get your normal Joe Block and get involved with him, they call them Joe Soap or whatever, uh, come and uh, uh, be a partner with me. Now it was to be, no, get me a relative of the DG, of the manager, of the procurement manager, of the president, the wife of the president, then at that point it was destroyed and that is where we are today many uh, so-called during the period of the radical economic transformation are fictitious all of them mm. sure. almost all of them yeah let me use that. so krista i mean how how important is it in your opinion that we that we now the private sector uh, and government and and the and the the, the, the public um sort of form a unity in terms of trying to get small business going i mean the i think the private sector can do a heck of a lot you know in terms of in terms of helping to spur on small business and do you think small business is the way to go for south africa yes you have no choice listen what is the point of big business big business is not big business is good for your country if it develop big through the natural causes of, of development business development but uh, if you make me instantly big, ah, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time, you're wasting resources. You're putting the country backward. So, but the key engine of economic growth, driving economic growth, is the empowerment of small businesses. Look, our government, I mean, there's a thing called uh, in black industrialists, okay? We heard that so many billions have been put in for this. Within a split second, you try, no, it's already allocated. To who? You don't know. How? You don't know. Because what they do, they take that money and they go and, uh, and choose people who they tell, go to that white company that is big, to ask them to buy the, the shares and then we will pay for it. Mm -hmm. What is that? There's no black industrialism about that. Mm -hmm. Whereas, if the government could help small people, let's say all these people who are running businesses, but it must be a system that works, so that if you arrive at a mama who's selling oranges and so on, and you ask her what is your, the first thing she will tell you, she needs a container. How much does a container cost? The container cost, uh, uh, about uh, 60,000 rand, or let's say if the government were to commit itself to it, it would buy it at 50,000 rand to give this mama to make up her food and things like that to sell to the public. Mm. And that would drive that mama. Do you hear me? I'm saying 60,000. I'm not saying 100,000. Mm. But now, when the mistake now what they are doing when they talk of empowering people, they want to talk about billions. Mm. Gosh, what is that? Mm. A, a billions given to a people with no business that is equivalent to that. It's a waste of money. Yep. Whereas you give that mama, that mama is going to grow her business. She is running it with it. She yep. needs just a container, okay? And she says to you, and I need to just prop up my stock. Mm. 
And you can work out how much stock does she need mm. in order just to be level. And then you grow her up that way. Mm. And then she has about 100 to 150,000 rand to run her affairs. Mm. And she says, you do that with everybody, starting from what I'm saying to the mama who needs that container. Mm. The same thing, the guy who needs a million rand to do what he's doing. Yeah. He needs to buy a bike out of that and to do this and that and that. Maybe he wants to be a, 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 a plumber. And then what do you give him? He goes and buys the equipment. It comes out of a million rand. This whole thing, what kills us here is this thing of believing that, yes, we can see we're doing something. If we give out, we dole out a billion rand. Forget mm. about that billion rand. Give the people the money that is proportionate to what they need. Yeah. And then the, the, the small enterprises will grow like that, you see? Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. You know, so you take a model that's already existing, that's already successful, albeit small, and then you help to expand on that model. Because if you have every small business that employs maybe one or two people, and you can expand that over ten thousand people, twenty thousand people, thirty thousand people, before you know it, you've got a workforce of two, three, four hundred thousand you know, people, and now we're starting to grow. Yeah, look, I mean, I I have experimented this. Okay, I've got a lot of projects that I have uh, set up. Many of them, like. I know that if I put a million to a, a thing, how many jobs you create for that? And I ask, and then you pay the salary that they want. People say is uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, what is that? Uh, yeah, the the proper salary that we have to pay for workers. It comes out of that, yeah. and then you develop, you employ people, you increase it, you increase it, you increase it, you increase it. You increase it. I, I, I visited uh, some time last year about, uh, I was invited by eight farmers, uh, black farmers, okay? These black farmers were given pieces of land. They, they, they were not given, but uh, sort of in this some way of pulling together a family of 15 or 20 people, and then you put their subsidies like the together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they go and buy. Yeah. You know what? It's the tragedy that I saw there. Sure. What I saw there was the biggest failure. These people, none of those farmers had electricity at their place. Sure. They, 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 they cook with pots outside with fire. The window panes are all gone. There is nothing. The farm is just this, as if there was never. They, the government gave them the 200,000 rent and that was it. Bye bye. Boom. From there, it was just the way down. I asked each and every one of them, was there a time when you have had a break? Never. Not a single one of them. And uh, you just think, those guys there, I can tell you, I look at them. If the government could commit three million for each one of them, the ones that I went to, I can tell you they will flourish like anything mm. because they would buy a tractor they will be able to buy a, a, a seeds. They will be able to get all the implements they need. Mm. And they will farm properly. Mm. And then that is a small, small scale. But people want just to talk about their billions and billions. I don't believe in that. I think it's crazy. Sure. Where would you get billions to give so many people? Whereas sure. a million, three million, two million, you can give it to so many people. Mm. And you can monitor them. Sure. And you can mentor them and you can give them advice, you can get people who can help them, and you can connect them with the markets. You can, they can work that way. Yeah, you see, and that's, that's the key right there, mentorship, you know, it's, it's useless giving yeah. people money unless you've got mentorship. We need, oh, we yeah. need to give people support. You've got to support people in every way. Open doors, open doors for networking, open doors for learning, open doors for finances, open doors for all sorts of things that can enable people to be successful because at the end of the day, if your individual success, if you succeed as an individual, we're succeeding as a nation. You know, it's so exactly. important that we, that we yeah. do this. We've got to follow that. I mean, uh, la last year, we went to some countries like uh, desert countries like uh, Jordan. And uh, on previous occasion, I've been to many different countries like Ethiopia and so on. I was amazed at the level of... Uh, uh, innovation, hard work, and uh, to see the results in places where actually the odds are just really, really tough, but people are making it mm. because 
if you've got systems in place, mm. it is easy. Mm. And the more you, you allow your people to, to prosper, more will prosper, more will prosper, more will prosper. You see? Ladies and gentlemen, if you've just tuned in, we're talking to Kusta Jack. This has been one of the most fascinating conversations I've had yet. Kusta, thank you so much. This has really been great. Um, what are the, if you had a, a message that, uh, that you wanted to leave our leaders today, what would that message be? No, my message would be that leaders must, must, uh, must stick to what they say they're going to do, to their promises. And they mustn't promise things that they cannot do. And uh, look, in the case of South Africans, I always argue with people that listen to South Africans, they know what needs to be done. Every South African knows what needs to be done. But the trouble, they want to see themselves at the destination without having done the walking. Mm. And my only problem with us is that if you are not going to do the walking, don't talk about the destination because you will never make it there. Mm -hmm. Now, so as things stands now, our president needs just to make sure that he does the small things in the country. Mm -hmm. For example, in my opinion, if the president were to, to say, first of all, I'm fed up with the crime in this country. And it's there. The statistics are telling me I'm not dreaming about it. Look what has happened. Everybody's going to believe you because they know somebody, a relative or a friend or a friend of a friend who has been killed in this senseless violence. And therefore, I'm going to put a stop to this. And then immediately, he goes to deal with people like, for example, the drug lords or the other identifiable nuisances to society. You deal with them because if he crushes those people, he's going to have everybody supporting him. Mm. Nobody will have a political basis to defend the actions of gangs and gang lords. Mm and other criminals. Mm. You see, once you, you, you are seeing your determination of dealing with that as a political figure, because you've got the political clout to deal with that, because it's unpolitical for people to kill people or to sell drugs or to rob or to all those kinds of things. So you can see immediate the result. You resolve, you want to get the results every day about it. It's going to work. And then the other thing is, on the economy, I will do this if I was a president. I will say, okay, fine. Look at ESCOM. Ladies and gentlemen, we have tried everything, and now this is what I want. I'm looking for a person who is going to meet my criteria and the criteria I set. And when that person gets into and make the criteria you are pointing and I support you as a president. You don't listen to people, everybody who got an idea about it, okay? You, there are times to listen, there are times when you say, okay, I've done the listening now, I'm done with it, I want the results, and you put that person there. Whether that person you get him from Iceland, from Czechoslovakia, or from anywhere, whether he's black, whether he's brown, you said you want a person, you set the criteria, the president backs that person, okay, to do what he said he was going to do. And you, you pull back. You will come back, you set the timetables when you will talk to him and you will have to get a report and you will, uh, 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 you will have your say that you want to say at that point, not in between. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And also, when it comes to small things like education, I will create, uh, uh, you know, uh, some points of excellence in the township where it will be my responsibility to see to it that in Kwamashu, 
There's going to be four schools that are going to be what I want them to be, okay? In, uh, in Danzane, there's going to be four. In Soweto, there's going to be eight. In New Brighton, everywhere, across the country, and in the Ekumbu, and Mkanduli, or Kwanyamazana, and so on and so on. And then you say, okay, this is what is going to happen. These are going to be the, 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 the macro cause of the kind of thing I want, that everyone is going to copy and do it that way. That's where you're going to start it, you know, so that you, you as a president, you pay attention. There are schools that are good in, the, in our township, and you can use even people like that as a base to show what, how to go back to the old days when our schools used to be good. My, myself and my kids, since we are in this uh, uh, lockdown, I was uh, going on reading them numerous uh, poetry because I have nothing to do. I show them how that I'm educated. Then I made the point to them. I said, yes, after all, Bantu Education, if you look at it, here am I. The Bantu Education program, I'm not scared of you with your freedom education, because they got the freedom education. I'm not scared of them, okay? <laughs> uh, because why? The teachers have taught us how. They were teachers. Mm -hmm. they, they wanted us to be educated. Mm -hmm. They had nothing, but they had only the commitment and the dedication passion. to get us educated. Yeah. And that's why we, most of anyone of that group of ours, going back to people who were that, we, when the system betrayed us, when the system rejected us, we had the teachers that embraced us and that loved us and mm -hmm. that gave us education and mm -hmm. made sure that we never become what Fairfoot wanted us to be. And here we are. And that's what I'm saying. So you need to have that kind of a commitment. Now, to a lot of schools in the townships, I don't know whether you know, here in P, they break them brick by brick. Okay? Gone. Nothing. Uh, schools that got it, long history and names they are gone so what i'm saying you can do that so the same with everything yeah with agriculture i will set up a, a, now so you you say to me i must do it today i'll say okay fine i'm going to choose to ask young black kids across the country uh, let's say even for that matter you can say proportionately to the demo demography, mm. demographics of the land. Uh, I need 5,000, okay? And then I'm going to create cadets, agricultural cadets. These kids are going to say what age and what qualification, if need be, or anything, but depending on the, on the kind of farming that they will be embarking on. And I say, okay, they come in. They say, I want to be a dairy farmer. I want to be a mealy farmer. I want to do this. I want to be uh, uh, to deal with pigs and so on and so on. And then you got them, you separate them. And then you send them, whilst I'll take them and send them and tell them that you are going to get a stipend, okay? Just to buy soap and uh, other things, creams and so on, that's all. You are going to be all dispatched into numerous farms across South Africa. Those who go for beef, you are going to go to the farms of uh, beef farmers. And the farmer there, you're going to demand nothing from him. Mm. We're going to give you uh, 3.5 or, yeah, or 4,000 or 3,000 rand a month. Make it lost. That's all. <laughs> for a period of uh, uh, two years, you're gonna work there on that farm day in and day out, okay? Then you do that across the board. What happened? In two years time, how many is left of that? Let's say 5,000, maybe 3,000 mm. are still there. Okay? Mm. Then you take those ones. You send them also to a further training for another year, okay? And then you break them. And after that, you are left with how many? On the fourth year, you are left with about, uh, of the group, uh, 2,000 if you are lucky, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this calculation can base it on the British settlers when they came to the Albany area in Greenstown in 1920, 
where they, they, they got 4,000 of them, okay? Just go and check the records and see how many were left there in two years' time. <laughs> we'll see. There was nothing. They were gone. Yeah. The great percentage was gone back to, to the cities to be barbers and uh, hairdressers and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you say the same principle you use, you are going to be down to maybe 1,500 of them. And then those ones, you buy farms, the state farms, where they will practice there on their own now as a group that you could uh, choose yourself how you go now. And you will see, then that is how of that, once they are there on the field, let's say 500 of them make it. Do you know how many farmers are those as a base to, for, to go forward? Because they will produce, reproduce hundreds and hundreds of other farmers. The same thing across the board. That's what you, I would do with that kind of stuff. Right? Sure. sure. Yeah, I mean, that speaks a lot to like the, the way that the Rickies used to work, right? They take you and they break you. And the, there's only a few people left. And those ones that are left are like, those are the guys that end up defending our country. <laughs> that's those all. Those are the guys you want to have. And that's the truth because the farmers do defend our country. You know, that without our people, yeah. we've got nothing. We, we don't have a defense. We, we, our people need to eat. Gusto, listen, this has been the most amazing discussion. I'd like to thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And hopefully we can have you on again at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's stay. Stay. <laughs> Let's stay. I'm staying. <laughs> There's no other choice, bro. <laughs> there is no other choice. We have to stay. South Africa, we've got problems now. Don't worry. We're going to overcome them. We need just to have guts to say what needs, what is correct, and say it loudly, just as much as those who are breaking it down. Those who are building it must shout as much as they can and drown the wreckers. And I can tell you, we can't go wrong. South Africa is going to be what each and every person fought for. Nelson Mandela has defined the South Africa he wants. The Freedom Charter is defined what South Africa ought to be, and it must be that. That's right. That's our job now to drive that legacy forward and make sure it happens. And we cool. have to. We have to. All right, Krista, take care, my friend. I'll chat to you soon. Thank you, man. All the best. Bye.